Thank you, Steve, for inviting me here uh, today, and, and many thanks to Dr. Cunningham and the Injury Center here at Michigan. I have a true confession to start out with here this morning. One of my Wisconsin colleagues earlier this morning thought it would be a nifty idea at the break if I flip this upside down. Uh, but then I heard Coach Carr talk about his bus ride, and I was sitting right next to him. I thought, that's probably not a real good idea. So many of you are probably thinking, wow, Mike McRae, a rare instance of good judgment. Uh, Steve has asked me to talk today about our work around the role of imaging and biomarkers uh, as sort of the next generation of, of concussion research, which I'm, I'm delighted to do and I, I plan to do here uh, this morning. But if I achieve only one thing here this morning, I hope it's um, that in 15 minutes or so, I impart a message that it maybe is the approach to my talk this morning more than the content itself at this juncture uh, that is the message that I, I hope to leave you with. And that is any discussion of imaging and biomarkers uh, has to be positioned in the context of the larger uh, scenario of sport-related concussion, civilian traumatic brain injury, um, or other uh, conditions of, of the like, uh, and what we're referring to as this neurobiopsychosocial uh, model of, of, of concussion. So uh, bear with me as I uh, walk you through uh, that concept, as, as new as it might be to the horizon, but I think all of the talks this morning uh, did me somewhat of a favor, especially uh, Jeff's talk a minute ago, sort of teeing up the idea that um, it's not likely to be about a single biomarker, given the heterogeneity of this, uh, of this injury itself, uh, the individual factors that we confront in, in athletes across various competitive environments, that biomarkers and imaging certain, uh, certainly have promise and are likely to play a role as, in advancing the basic and clinical science of concussion, but they themselves are not likely to be the, uh, the end-all, be-all that, that maybe they were uh, presented as uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, Dr. Guskowitz opened this morning by making the point that concussion is by no means new to the landscape of, of contact and, and collision sports. Uh, arguably, the most notorious concussion in NFL history occurred on October 20th, 1960. And some of you in the room, I think Coach Carr uh, has left for the day, but some of you in the room are probably familiar with who that is laid out on the ground. That's Frank Gifford from the New York Giants, uh, who was maybe the highest profile player in the league at the time, uh, laid out unconscious by local bad boy from Philly, Chuck Bednarik, who passed away, uh, interestingly enough, just a month or so ago. The backstory here, however, is despite Frank Gifford's profile in the game, and that he missed 18 months of participation, this was not really household news. It really wasn't until the mid-1990s or so where several high-profile and, frankly, highly compensated athletes started to come forward expressing their concerns about concussion, particularly repetitive uh, injuries over a short period of time, and it raised the national awareness, uh, both within sporting organizations and, and the larger society. But what I hope is one of the messages here this morning and, and throughout the day is that the real game changer uh, in this discussion has been better science. That many large scale studies over the past uh, two or three decades have uh, greatly informed our understanding of the natural history of this injury and put us in a much better position in 2015 to make findings and discoveries of major translational significance that assist us directly on the sideline in the clinic in the management of our athletes, as was uh, discussed uh, a minute ago by uh, Dr. Kutcher. Two people that don't get nearly enough credit, uh, who started this movement afoot nearly three decades, Jeff Barth and Steve Machaki, who at the time were both at the University of Virginia, started to realize as brain injury researchers in a civilian setting, that perhaps the competitive contact and collision sports environment provided us a real-time in vivo laboratory to study brain injury. Their, their real foresight was twofold. Number one, they wanted to derive some benefit to the sports medicine community that would assist us in understanding sport-related concussion and driving evidence-based approaches to injury diagnosis, assessment, management, and return to play decision-making. 
but it really was their larger vision that is what what they should be known for and 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 recognized for um, that we all benefit from, and that is that we could study this phenomena in athletes and translate the findings to our understanding of brain injury and concussion in the larger population in general, in civilians and military service members, uh, for instance. They were the first to recognize that there are sometimes rare occurrences and neurologic phenomena that occur right in front of us, either on the sideline or to several million people who are viewing this on television on a Saturday afternoon, such as this one, where see you, you see an athlete take an impact is a, in a completely un, uh, unresponsive and posturing position that neurology residents wouldn't see very often even in an ICU. But you're seeing on television on a Saturday afternoon, and then as Dr. Kutcher mentioned, you're in a position to conduct emergency management of that injury within seconds in front of 70,000 people. Dr. Barth and Machaki recognized this for its value as a laboratory, and it's really the, the work that has been done by many people in this room over the last three decades that now puts us in a position where we have truly evidence-based consensus guidelines. Here are four examples that have been published in the last few years by uh, relevant organizations in this space, providing us with an evidence-based approach to injury diagnosis, assessment, management, and return-to-play decision-making. This is no longer about how many fingers am I holding up. It's no longer about uh, same-day return to play. It's no longer about dark rooms as a means of rehabilitation and recovery. We have a, a strong template that is based on sound evidence over the past two decades that drives best practice in the management of, of sport-related concussion. And as I mentioned, the findings and discoveries in the sports world have been immediately translational to what we understand about brain injury and how we manage civilians and military service members affected by this injury. A prime example is if you look at the Zurich Statement and, and Program of Graded Exertion, how we go about managing athletes, and you lay next to it the Department of Defense's recent publication on return to uh, active duty and military service members, you will see that it's really just wordsmithing. And our approach to management of injuries in the military service uh, sector is very overlapping and similar to what the evidence points us uh, toward in the sporting environment, allowing us to have a better impact, a, a, a larger impact on society in general uh, in the sector of, of traumatic brain injury. In 2015, that really leaves us with a question as to where do we go here and how high can we aim from a scientific standpoint in advancing the research around sport-related concussion, all in an effort as Coach Carr pointed out, to maximize the safety of young athletes who participate in all sports, particularly those with a higher incidence of, of concussion, as pointed out by Dr. Guskowitz. And we take that obligation very seriously. Um, as, as Dr. Duma pointed out, um, we tend to be agnostic as it, rely, as it applies to methods and means, but we also understand that we have a responsibility as scientists and, and, and public health specialists to maximize the safety for young athletes and, as he pointed out, to some extent, save the game, whether it's football, hockey, or other contact and collision sports. Where I think we stand at this juncture is we know a lot about the time course and the true natural history of, of clinical recovery. How long does it typically take an individual, an athlete, a heavy machinery operator, a military service member, to achieve a complete recovery in terms of symptoms, cognitive ability, balance and other functional capacities that are known to be affected by concussion. But what we don't know a lot about is how long does it take for recovery to, to occur at a brain level? So in other words, what is the true natural time course of physiological recovery after concussion? This, this parallel discussion really has major implications that was uh, touched on by Dr. Kutcher, and that is if these two time frames completely overlap, meaning the point at which an athlete tells me he or she is symptom-free, they're completely normal on all tests that I can throw at them, and their brain has achieved a complete physiological recovery, then how we currently do things is perfectly fine. But if we start to discover, for instance, that the time course or the tail of physiological recovery extends a bit beyond the time course of clinical recovery, then ideally we would want to know the totality of 
of that natural history of injury and recovery and guide our clinical decision making and return to play profiling based on the totality of both clinical and physiological recovery. That puts into context this notion that we are out in hot pursuit of the perfect single objective biomarker that would be an indicator of, of complete recovery. It's, it's that sort of theoretical construct that put this movement in motion uh, more than a decade around the idea that we'd have a blood test, a, a single biomarker that would say yay or nay concussion diagnoses. But more importantly, yay or nay athlete is fully recovered and fit to return to competition. That's been the exercise now for more than a decade with numerous casualties along the way. Um, and what I hope to impart on you today is that it's, it's going to take a much larger and more comprehensive approach, both diagnostically and prognostically, to get us there in, in terms of translational significance in a clinical setting. Real quickly, I want to review uh, some of the evidence over the, the, from our group and others over the last uh, 20 years on this notion of the true natural history of clinical recovery. How long does it take athletes to recover? So here's data on nearly 800 athletes from a paper we published a couple years ago. And have, these are uh, replication of earlier findings that, from our original NCAA concussion study in the, in the late 90s. And we were early on surprised to find that 20% of our athletes have a complete symptom recovery in the first day, inside 24 hours of injury. And just north of 85% of athletes report a complete symptom recovery in less than a week. Now, the obvious criticism of these data are what? That they are based solely on player self-report. And as Coach pointed out earlier, we know the motivations of athletes. They'll do anything in their power to get back on the field as, as fast as they can. That's been the stereotype for, for years. We also know that many of these 800 athletes are football players. And what's magical about seven days? Injury occurs on Friday night. They show up in the training room on Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, and it, it always goes the same. I had an incredible night's sleep last night. I really think I should go tonight. And it's usually on Thursday so they can go through the walkthrough and be cleared for Friday night. So Kevin and I used to laugh that if we had a, a dime for every Thursday morning uh, high school football concussion miracle, we'd be, we wouldn't be here right now probably. But it, it, it does beg the question is, is symptom recovery, based on self-report, truly recovery? And then that set in motion another movement uh, roughly 20 years ago in an effort, and that, that is really the entree of neuropsychologists into this space. Could we develop objective tests that the athlete couldn't cheat on, that they couldn't... Um, they couldn't outperform the test, right? We needed an objective marker that once they're telling me that they're symptom-free, I can throw a test at them, and if there's, if there's impairment there, the objective test will, will identify it. And that really started in motion the performance-based approach to recovery, utilizing neurocognitive testing. And, and here is sort of the lay of the land on the effects, the neurocognitive effects of, of concussion that really have two possible explanations. And, and that is, within the super acute period, as we call it, the first 24 hours, there are very large effect sizes. You, you, you can interpret these uh, using the classification system there uh, below. That uh, When you're looking at Cohen's D uh, statistics, uh, anywhere in the range of, of 0.2 is very small, 0.5 is, is medium, and, and 0.8 is large. Well. Not surprisingly, within the first 24 hours of concussion, the effect sizes are north of 1.0. But what we find on neurocognitive testing is this is a very rapidly diminishing signal. That within the first few days, it drops into the medium range around 0.5. And when you get out past a week, those effect sizes approach 0.2. And at a month, they approach zero. What this tells us is that on neurocognitive testing, the effect sizes past about six days are so small on our tests that they're not likely reliably detectable at the individual case level. So the two interpretations here are either we need better mouse traps because the sensitivity of our measures really drops off rapidly, or 
this is what cognitive recovery actually looks like after sport-related concussion. And I think the, the evidence is, is, is still leaving that door open a bit. But these data have been replicated numerous times, uh, indicating that the time course of, of clinical recovery, whether it be symptoms, cognition, balance, or otherwise, uh, really falls this natural linear pathway over a period of several days. Now, as a sports parent, that's the other hat that I wear most of my life these days, this is pretty damn good news, right? About 90% of athletes achieve a complete recovery, not only in terms of what they tell us about their symptoms, but how they perform on cognitive and balance testing relative to their own personal baseline, indicating an uncomplicated recovery in the order of seven to 10 days in about 90% of athletes. But it still begs the question, what's the time course of physiological recovery? And, and when they clear every clinical measure, how do I know that their brain has achieved a, a, a complete recovery at a physiological level? And that's what we consider to be the, the next great frontier in, in brain injury or concussion science. Utilizing and leveraging modern day technologies, imaging, blood serum biomarkers, protein indicators, et cetera, to tell us at what time point is the brain fully recovered and that athlete fully fit to return to competition. Our lab at MCW has been involved in this work for several years, utilizing quantitative EEG, uh, advanced MRI, and now uh, uh, emerging blood serum and, and protein biomarkers to look at this from a physiological and neurobiological standpoint. This is work that uh, is led by uh, our imaging scientists at MCW in which we uh, conduct both blood serum biomarker uh, collection prior to injury an advanced MRI uh, at several time points post-injury, trying to determine at what point, because we do find inside 24 hours in our studies, that we find robust changes in functional connectivity, blood flow, diffusion, and other imaging biomarkers, consistent with that reported by other groups, but that that signal is also diminishing rapidly over time. And the, the aim of this work at, at this point in time is much as we've done for 25 years, work led by Kevin and, and, and our group, uh, to determine at what point does the signal normalize physiologically, just as our work has, has outlined from a clinical standpoint um, over the last two decades or, or so. The lay of the land, as I interpret it right now, based on evidence from our laboratory and, and several other groups around the world, start to, starts to converge around this idea of an integrated model of recovery. And, and it, it follows uh, much along these lines, that if we assume, perhaps boldly, that an athlete or a young person has a, is in a normal state of cerebral function uh, prior to their I injury impact, a concussive event occurs, and there is an acute period during which, as Dr. Kutcher pointed out, the athlete is likely to have severely elevated symptoms of headache, dizziness, uh, poor concentration and otherwise. They have, as you saw, very large effect sizes on clinical testing. And we find robust signal abnormalities across a number of biological and imaging biomarkers within that super acute period, right? That's an easy phase for all clinicians. But a few days later, it starts to get a little murky, right? The athlete is hanging around, pestering you in the training room. I feel great. I had a great night's sleep last night. You throw every clinical test in your arsenal at them. They outperform their baseline. They've been symptom-free for a period of days. Their cognitive functioning is normal. But there is an emerging, albeit small, body of evidence in the literature to suggest from our group and others around the world that these signal abnormalities of neurobiological recovery have a slightly more extended tail beyond the time point of clinical recovery. And it's at some later time point that the athlete is not only clinically recovered, but clean in terms of all indicators of neurobiological recovery. And as a scientist, the ultimate aim here is to know what is the total period of clinical and physiological recovery that would guide our clinical decision making and uh, protect that athlete, that heavy machinery operator, that military service member, 
from a period of cerebral vulnerability during which they might be exposed to additional risk upon return to competitive sports and additional head impacts. That really, in our minds, is the next generation of evidence-based approach to tell us how long is long enough. And equally important, as was pointed out by several speakers this morning, is what is the potential benefit, I'm not saying the influence, what is the potential benefit of active rehabilitation during the period of neurobiological recovery? I think the notion of cocoon therapy has hopefully been put to bed forever. And where our group is headed is not only around, and you'll, you'll hear reference to this later, uh, work by Danny Thomas in a, in a small clinical trial at our institution showing that, in fact, activity, as Dr. Kutcher pointed out, after an immediate period of brief rest, activity outdoes rest, whether it's athletes or others uh, who are returning to normal activity. What we'd like to know is what is the influence of active rehabilitation in facilitating neurobiological recovery. The fact of the matter is, there is no condition in medicine in which we recommend total rest. If I have a four vessel cardiac bypass procedure this morning at 6.30, what am I doing this afternoon at 2.30? They're walking me up and down the hallway, right? But somehow the train got off the track a few years ago suggesting that we should put athletes in dark rooms which we believe is not only detrimental to neurobiological recovery, but we also know what it does to elite athletes who are accustomed to not sitting around very much. As it relates to biomarkers, just as it did 10 years ago to cognitive testing and balance testing and so on and so forth, the same old burning questions are posed, and that is, what is the sensitivity of this individual biomarker or a collective set of biomarkers not only in terms of its diagnostic utility, but in its prognostic predictive utility in predicting an athlete's eventual course of recovery. For three decades, we've been fascinated with sensitivity, digging deeper and deeper, peeling onions further and further to find the most sensitive metric, really at the expense or the, at the sacrifice of the other side of this equation. What is the specificity of that marker? What is its unique signal detection relevant to mild traumatic brain injury or concussion? And ultimately, what is the diagnostic and prognostic utility of a biomarker or a collective set of biomarkers at the individual case level? Early on, for instance, diffusion tensor imaging was thought to be um, gold in the, in the study of mild traumatic brain injury. It showed enormous sensitivities early on in a small uh, cadre of studies until we had enough data gathered to realize with adequate control groups that the overlap in DTI signal, the best performing DTI metric, between injured and control samples, the overlap was in the order of 85%. I can hand you a quarter and you can use that in your clinic to determine whether or not the next patient coming in is an MTBI patient or a normal control based solely on a DTI metric. Again, the context here being that a biomarker by itself is going to be of very limited utility unless you're addressing it in the context of the total neurobiopsychosocial model of injury. To complicate matters further, we also understand from the work of David Havda, Chris Giza, and other basic scientists in this space over the last 20 years, that the path, the path of physiology of mild traumatic brain injury and concussion is a moving target. The implication here is that the best performing biomarker from a diagnostic standpoint with an stat two hours post-injury may have very little utility to you eight days post-injury as you're trying to determine the time course of physiological recovery and vice versa. So it's not only the heterogeneity of the mechanism and the clinical manifestation of the injury itself, it's the heterogeneity of the pathophysiology of this injury over time that really cripples us around this theory that we're going to find a single diagnostic and prognostic biomarker. We have, as a group, for years tried to look at what factors predict prolonged recovery 
after concussion in athletes. This is a paper that we published a year or so ago in a large sample of about 600 athletes where we, uh, we had published previously that 90% of this sample had a complete uncomplicated clinical recovery inside seven days. We were interested in the 10%. What factors predisposed an athlete to having a, what we called an atypical or prolonged recovery beyond seven days? Interestingly enough, it was the acute injury characteristics. Whether an athlete was rendered unconscious, whether they had measurable post-traumatic amnesia, and the severity of their symptoms inside 24 hours. What that indicated to us is this group was predisposed to a prolonged recovery because they likely had a more severe gradient of injury. That message had been thrown out years ago that acute injury characteristics were really irrelevant in predicting recovery and grading scales and so on. But here in a large sample, it re those, those acute injury characteristics were the only factors that were predictive of who required more than seven days to recovery. We then started looking deeper into this sample, and this is work by my colleague Lynn Nelson, is yet unpublished, it's uh, uh, likely to go in within a week or so, where we had access to not only acute clinical characteristics and, and clinical metrics, but also some pre-injury baseline assessments of personality structure. And we find two very informative messages here in a large data set, and that is, again, Acute symptom severity is a very strong predictor of recovery time in high school and collegiate athletes. But what also factors into recovery time is something astonishing to us, and that is their total score on something called the BSI, uh, the Brief Symptom Inventory Somatization Scale, but it's their score not post-injury, it's their score at pre-injury baseline. So talk about the neurobiopsychosocial model. The only two factors in a gargantuous regression model that predict recovery time in high school and collegiate athletes is how severely they were injured and the manifestation of their symptoms inside 24 hours and the psychological makeup of the athlete that comes to the injury, indicating that athletes who were predisposed to somatic tendencies prior to their participation, prior to their injury, are also predisposed to longer recovery times and symptom reporting after concussion. Take it one step further. When we look at athletes who are at risk of prolonged symptoms be beyond 45 days, it's only the BSI somatization index at pre-injury baseline that is predictive of who's at risk of being in that group. When we look at all the acute injury characteristics none of them as measures of injury severity are predictive of who is symptomatic 45 days post-injury. By the way, in this sample, it's less than 3% of, of all athletes who remain symptomatic beyond 45 days, but I think many of you in the room would attest to the fact that you might have a clinic that's full of athletes who fall into that category, and it really is a, it, it, in our minds, this lens real-life evidence in support of this neurobiopsychosocial model, and that is that there are multiple predictor variables, both neurobiological and psychosocial, that not only predict one's risk of injury, but also are predictive of their natural recovery time course clinically and perhaps neurobiologically. At the same time, the challenge to researchers, like many of you, is you need a multidimensional array of outcome measures that allow you to assess both the neurobiological and the psychosocial sides of the house because the evidence clearly points in the direction that if a, there's a synergy or a convergence, a confluence here around both neurobiological and psychological factors that influence risk and recovery. The big challenge at a real life level is how in the hell are we gonna do that in a single study design, right? You're asking me to look at neurologic vulnerabilities, head impact exposure, uh, biomarkers, structural and functional brain uh, integrity, and whether they're happy or sad on the day of injury. And uh, I was dumb enough to actually sign up for a study like this. We are uh, we're very grateful, and this is a project that I uh, am, am honored to, to lead co-lead with uh, Steve here at Michigan and our
our partner in crime, Tom McAllister at, at IU, uh, in Indiana University, with the strong support from Dr. Hainline and the NCAA, and a vested interest and active support from the Department of Defense, again, with this translational model in mind that we can learn a lot from sport-related concussion research. This is a massive undertaking known as the, the CARE Consortium, the Concussion Assessment Research and Education Consortium, um, that has two arms. One that uh, has, uh, Steve has already enrolled north of 10,000, uh, 12,000, I'm sorry, he enrolled 2,000 yesterday, apparently. Uh, uh, 12,000 athletes in a clinical study with a longitudinal time course. And I am uh, uh, honored to lead the Advanced Research Corps, the ARC, that takes a deeper dive into the neurobiological aspects of, of concussion. Um, we have engaged Dr. Duma and Dr. Rosen at Virginia Tech, Dr. Guskowitz at UNC, Dr. Giza and colleagues at UCLA, and Dr. Allison Brooks at Wisconsin, where all of these athletes undergo uh, preseason blood biomarker biospecimen collection. We have advanced imaging. Uh, all these athletes in football are instrumented with head impact measurement technologies and we have a detail, very detailed post-injury protocol. Um, and something unique to this study is we've also incorporated two control groups, a contact sport control group that will allow us to compare the effects of injury itself in two groups that have exposure. And then we have a non-contact sport control group that will allow us to tease out the effects of exposure separate from concussive injury uh, itself. The aim of this is to integrate really um, the total picture, the neurobiopsychosocial model that looks at the biomechanical, clinical, neuroimaging, blood, and psychological health factors that are predictive of the natural history of clinical and physiological recovery after concussion. This is a massive undertaking. Um, again, uh, I, it was one of those scenarios where wouldn't it be unbelievable to achieve this? And then when the project was approved, I thought, holy crap, are we really going to do this? Um, and, and since then, I've just been spending day and night trying to keep up with Steve. Uh, what I hope to do is come back in a year and two years and report to you real-life evidence from a very large prospective study. We're enrolling 1,400 athletes in this study uh, in the neighborhood of about 125 concussed athletes and equal numbers in those other two control groups and provide real-life evidence to you in support of the value of imaging and, and biomarkers but again, in the larger context of this neurobiopsychosocial model of injury. I really think the important message here is that society is at a crossroads. And just as the, the society in, in, in large was looking to us 20 years ago for some evidence on how long it typically took a, an athlete to recover clinically and how we should manage them to facilitate their recovery, I would argue that let's look to the science again for the answers and, and influence the household discussions that are taking place about whether sons or daughters should participate in contact sports. Let's inform those discussions with science rather than rhetoric. Thank you much.